It was in the year of our Lord, 1629, that Meyer, Walter von Twiller, was appointed governor of the province of New Netherlands. Under the commission and control of their high mightiness, the Lord States General of the United Netherlands and the privileged West India Company, this renowned old gentleman arrived at New Amsterdam in the merry month of June, the sweetest month in all the year, when Dan Apollo seems to dance upon the transparent firmament, when the robin, the thrush, and a thousand other wanton songsters make the woods to resound with amorous ditties, and the luxurious little Bob Lincoln revels among the clover blossoms of the meadows, all of which, happy coincidence, persuaded the old dames of New Amsterdam, who were skilled in the art of foretelling events, that this was to be a happy and prosperous administration. The renowned Walter Van Twiller was descended from a long line of Dutch burgomasters, who had successfully dozed away their life and grown fat upon the bench of magistrates in Rotterdam, and who had comported themselves with such singular wisdom and propriety that they were never either heard or talked of, which, next to being universally applauded, should be the object of all magistrates and rulers. There are two opposite ways by which some men make a figure in the world, one by talking faster than they think, and the other by holding their tongues and not thinking at all. By the first, many a smattered acquires the reputation of a man of quick parts. By the other, many a dunderpat, like the owl, the stupidest of birds, comes to be considered the very type of wisdom. This, by the way, is a casual remark, which I would not, for the universe, have it thought I apply to Governor Van Twiller. It is true, he was a man shut up within himself, like an oyster, and rarely spoke, except in monosyllables. But then it was allowed he seldom said a foolish thing. So invincible was his gravity that he was never known to laugh, or even to smile, through the whole course of a long and prosperous life. Nay, if a joke were uttered in his presence, that set light-minded hearers in a roar, it was observed to throw him in a state of perplexity. Sometimes he would inquire into the matter, and when, after much explanation, the joke was made as plain as a pike staff, he would continue to smoke his pipe in silence and at length, knocking out the ashes, would exclaim, Well, I see nothing in all that to laugh about. With all his reflective habits, he never made up his mind on a subject. His adherents accounted for this by the astonishing magnitude of his ideas. He conceived every subject on so grand a scale that he had not room in his head to turn it over and examine both sides of it. Certainly it is that if any matter were propounded to him on which ordinary mortals would rashly determine at a first glance, he would put on a vague, mysterious look, shake his capricious head, smoke some time in profound silence, and at length observe that he had his doubts about the matter, which gained him the reputation of a man slow of belief and not easily imposed upon. What is more... It gained him a lasting name, for to this habit of the mind has been attributed his surname of Twiller, which is said to be a corruption of the original Twidgefiller, or, in plain English, Doubter. The person of this illustrious old gentleman was formed and proportioned as though it had been molded by the hands of some cunning Dutch statuary, as a model of majesty and lordly grandeur. He was exactly five feet six inches in height, and six feet five inches in circumference. His head was a perfect sphere, and of such stupendous dimensions that Dame Nature, with all her sex's ingenuity, would have been puzzled to construct a neck capable of supporting it. Wherefore, she wisely declined the attempt, 
and settled it firmly on top of his backbone, just between the shoulders. His body was oblong, and particularly capricious at bottom, which was wisely ordered by Province, seeing that he was a man of sedentary habit, and very adverse to the idle labor of walking. His legs were short, but sturdy in proportion to the weight they had to sustain, so that when erect he had the appearance of a beer barrel on skids. His face, that infallible index of the mind, presented a vast expanse, and furrowed by those lines and angles which disfigure the human countenance with what is termed expression. Two small gray eyes twinkled feebly in the mist, like two stars of lesser magnitude in the hazy firmament, and his full-fed cheeks, which seemed to have taken toll on everything that went into his mouth, were curiously mottled and, and streaked with dusty red, like a Spitzenberg apple. His habits were as regular as his person. He daily took his four stated meals, exactly an hour to each. He smoked and doubted eight hours, and he slept the remaining twelve of the four and twenty. Such was the renowned Wouter Van Twiller, a true philosopher. For his mind was either elevated above, settled below, the cares and perplexities of this world. He had lived in it for years, without feeling the least curious to know whether the sun revolved around it or it around the sun, and he had watched for at least half a century, the smoke curling from his pipe to the ceiling, without once troubling his head with any of those numerous theories by which a philosopher would have perplexed his mind in according for its rising above the surrounding atmosphere. In his council he presided with great state and solemnity. He sat in a huge chair of solid oak, hewn in the celebrated forest of the Hague, fabricated by an experienced timberman of Amsterdam, and curiously carved about the arms and feet into exact imitations of a gigantic eagle's claws. Instead of a scepter, he swayed a long Turkish pipe, wrought with jasmine and amber, which had been presented to the stadtholder of Holland at the conclusion of a treaty with one of those petty Barbary powers. In this stately chair would he sit, and this magnificent pipe would he smoke, shaking his right knee with a constant motion, and fixing his eyes for hours together upon a little print of Amsterdam, which hung in a black frame against the opposite wall of the council chamber. <laughs> Nay, it has been said that with any deliberation of extraordinary length and intricacy was on the carpet, the renowned Walter would shut his eyes for a full two hours at a time, that he might not be disturbed by external objects. And at such times the internal commotion of his mind was evinced by certain regular guttural sounds, which his admirers declared were merely the noise of conflict, made by his contending doubts and opinions. It is with infinite difficulty I have been able to collect these biographical anecdotes of the great man under consideration. The facts representing him were so scattered and vague, and divers of them so questionable in point of authenticity, that I had to give up the search after many and declined the admission of still more, which would have tended to heighten the coloring of his portrait. I have been the more anxious to delineate fully the persons and habits of Walter van Twiller, from the consideration that he was not only the first, but also the best governor that ever presided over this ancient and respectable province. And so tranquil, benevolent was his reign, that I did not find throughout the whole of it a single instance of any offender being brought to punishment, a most indisputable sign of a merciful governor, and a case unparalleled, excepting in the reign of the illustrious King Log, from whom it is hinted the renowned Van Twiller was a lineal descendant. The very outset of the career of this excellent magistrate was distinguished by an example of legal acumen, 
that gave flattering examples of a wise and equitable administration. The morning after he had been installed in office, and at the moment that he was making his breakfast from a prodigious earthen dish filled with milk and Indian pudding, he was interrupted by the appearance of Wandel Schoonover, a very important old burgher of New Amsterdam, who complained bitterly of one Barrett Bleeker, inasmuch as he refused to come to a settlement of accounts. Seeing that there was a heavy balance in favor of the said Wandel, Governor Van Twiller, as I have already observed, was a man of few words. He was likewise a mortal enemy to multiplying writings, or being disturbed at his breakfast. Having listened attentively to the statement of Wandel Schoonover, given an occasional grunt as he shoveled a spoonful of Indian pudding into his mouth, either as a sign that he relished the dish, or comprehended the story, and he called unto him his constable, and pulling out of his bridge's pants a huge jackknife, dispatched it at the defendant as a summons, accompanied by his tobacco-box as a warrant. This summary process was as effectual in those simple days, as was the seal ring of the, of the great Harren Allrest, among the true believers. The two parties being confronted before him, each produced a book of accounts, written in a language and character that would have puzzled any but a high Dutch commentator or a learned decipherer of Egyptian obelisks. The sage Wouter took them one after the other, and having poised them in his hand and attentively counting over the number of leaves, fell straight away into a great doubt and smoked for half an hour without saying a word. At length, laying his finger beside his nose, and shutting his eyes for a moment, with an air of a man who just caught a subtle idea by the tail, he slowly took his pipe from his mouth, puffed forth a column of tobacco smoke, and with marvelous gravity and solemnity pronounced that having carefully counted over the leaves and weighed the book, it was found that one was just as thick and heavy as the other. Therefore, it was the final opinion of the court that the accounts were equally balanced. Therefore, Wandel should give Barrett a receipt, and Barrett should give Wandel a receipt, and the constable should pay the costs. Now this decision, being straightway made known, diffused general joy throughout New Amsterdam for well, the people immediately perceived that they had a wise and equitable magistrate to rule over them. But its happiest effect was that not another lawsuit took place throughout the whole of his administration, and the office of constable fell into such decay that there was not one of those losel scouts known in the province for many years. I am the more particular in dwelling on this transaction, not only because it deemed it one of the most sage and righteous judgments on record, and well worthy of the attention of modern magistrates, but because it was a miraculous event in the history of the renowned Wouter, being the only time he was ever known to come to a decision in the whole course of his life.